Hi, I'm Andy Fitzgerald. I'm Kaylee Ching. I'm Coco. And we are here to present our proposition for the application of quantum dots in the brain. Okay, so throughout history, there have been a few factors about your life that have been deemed unchangeable. One of these is your height, which is um, primor okay. it's primarily determined by your genetics, so you can't change it. Just recently, we've been coming up with ways to create human growth hormone in the lab, but that still has problems. So through this method that we are um, proposing, we have shown that we can create that we can stimulate the hypothalamus in a human brain to create more growth hormone in order to increase one's height. Because I gotta say, some of us just get the short end of the stick. So, okay, yeah. So we propose to test this in vivo on a rat model first. So it is hoped that this novel technique will begin to elucidate the mysteries of the brain as well as pave the way for an eventual human model of this technology because of the way this technique is set up, a human model is not quite, it's, the science is not quite there yet for a human model. So our question is, can nanotechnology and nanoscale microscopy be used to artificially stimulate brain neurons? So background of LED and quantum dots. LEDs are used in many applications in life. They are commonly made of yellow and red phosphors. But the problem with LEDs is that they have wide emission bandwidth, especially for red phosphors, because the red color is on the edge of the sensitivity spectrum of our eyes. So to overcome this problem, quantum dots have been developed. They are made of new phosphors and phosphor combinations, which are green, yellow, and red. This discovery provides a higher quality of light than LEDs. So quantum dots are semiconductor light emitting nanocrystals with nanometer sized structures of unique optical properties. They have bright fluorescence, which are able to emit fluorescent light of different wavelengths. They can also be used as nanoscopic light bulbs to light up and color specific cells that need to be studied and under a microscope. These properties make quantum dots a perfect tool for visualization of brain structures and the mechanisms underlying its function. Due to their um, unique properties, um, even single molecules can be observed. And this image show, shows the blue LEDs excite the red and green cadmium free quantum dots um, in re uh, resulting in high quality white light. Now you might be wondering, how do these quantum dots glow? Well, for that, we need to go down to the quantum scale and look at the single atoms. So when the single atoms are excited by a laser, what happens is that the single atom loses an electron to the actual orbital surrounding the quantum dot because it functions like an atom itself. So it loses an electron to the gap where an electron should be, and the electron on the outside of the orbital of the quantum dot, they bond together. And when the electron finally becomes, and that's called an excitant or exciton, not sure how to pronounce it, but when that electron comes back into the original atom it came from, that's when it produces that um, fluorescent glow that they're known for. Now, you might be thinking these are really expensive and hard to create, and I can tell you um, from what I know, they are not. They are easy. Well, some of them are easy to create and cost-effective, like this week we've been trying to create them in our dorm. Um, also, one benefit of these quantum dots is that they offer less photo bleaching and last for a very long time compared to other types of fluorescent microscopy like uh, GFP. Uh, okay, now, fluorescence microscopy. To understand fluorescence microscopy, you have to understand fluorescence. Fluorescence is the emission of light. Now, and fluorescence of microscopy requires fluorophores, or something that glow, grow, glows, and the main one used for this is GFP, but we'll, we will be using um, quantum dots to accomplish this. Okay, and another main topic in fluorescence microscopy is the red shift, where a light that shines, if you shine a blue light at a quantum dot, a green light will glow back. It shifts the color, one color, towards red on the spectrum. Another reason why we chose quantum dots for this is because of the localized imaging. Quantum dots can be, deliver light to very specific areas of like the brain, whereas if you use sound or other types of light, you're not gonna get that precision that a quantum dot offers. Okay, now, our plan, let's see. Okay, 
our plan. So for our plan, we need to first get our materials. Our materials require quantum dots of certain size, carbon quantum dots would work, and we also need genetically engineered rats with a photosensitivity to a certain bandwidth of light in the brain. Now, from there, what we need to do is cut a hole or like a little sunroof in the head of the rat, which is why we can't really do this on humans. But this is so we can put the quantum dots in the brain and position them exactly where we want. Now, this is where the, when the fluorescence microscopy comes in. From there, we're gonna look with our little microscope and make sure those quantum dots are in the right place so that it, we only stimulate the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, because if we don't do that, we can have a lot of other issues. And um, the fact that you can actually find the specific part of the hypothalamus that produces human growth hormone has been proven by Akira Matsuno. Now, from there, we are going to take that um, that we are going to take that uh, genetically engineered mouse with a specific bandwidth of light sensitivity in the brain. We are going to shine a different color light onto its brain, and then from there, the red shift will counteract it. So only the part, only the hypothalamus and actually I have it up here. Only the hypothalamus and pituitary glands will be stimulated, the rest of it, it will just be fine. There'll be no other effects, in theory. And then from there, the brain will continue to produce more growth hormone, causing this rat to grow very large or much, will cause it to grow much longer and much larger than it normally would. Now you might be wondering where we came up with this idea. Now people who are in the program, you might have seen this video before. It's this video of this rat, which it's a uh, use of optogenetics. So they're doing something similar that we are. They're shining, also shining lasers in the brain. What this is so they can uh, uh, use light activated predator instincts in the brain of that mouse. Now another thing that, quant another application of this is quantum dots have are currently being worked on for use in the human brain for um, as a cure for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's to stimulate other parts of the brain. Um, now we hope that with our research, other scientists can perhaps add on because there are some aspects of uh, our research that still remains unanswered. For example, um, we would uh, it would be ideal if we could find a non-invasive way to get the quantum dots into the brain, uh, as well as getting a light source, because uh, the current method we propose, we would have to have, as Andy described, a sunroof in the rat's brain. Um, so if we could solve and answer these questions, we could perhaps uh, apply this to humans to solve of, uh, to cure uh, brain disease. And also, um, there's the possibility of curing uh, the growth hormone disorder. Okay, so possible solution to GHD um, of human. GHD is growth hormone deficiency, which occurs when the pituitary gland doesn't produce enough growth hormone. It, it affects children more commonly than adults. So GHD can be present from birth, resulting from genetic mutations or structural defects in the brain. It can also be acquired later in life as a result of infection, radiation therapy, or tumor uh, growth within the brain. Um, so there are two ways that we can insert quantum dots into the human brain as a possible solution of GHD. We can use carbon dots or traditional quantum dots with biocompatible molecules. So the difference between them is that the car carbon dots um, can penetrate blood-brain barrier without conjugation. Uh, in an experiment done in 2015, the data indicates that um, the carbon dots are able to freely penetrate the blood-brain barrier and precisely target on a specific tissue. So similarly, the carbon dots can also possibly target the pituitary gland precisely. In contrast, the, uh, the quantum dots are required to conjugate with a cell-penetrating peptide TAT in order to, to cross the blood-brain barrier based on the fact that quantum dot itself cannot label the brain tissue. But the quantum dots with biocompatible molecules, which is the peptide TAT, can also be used to target on the pituitary gland as a possible solution of GHD. So we also hope that um, our research can contribute more to science by finding out more, res uh, more uh, uses for quantum dots because they are a relatively new technology. We also hope um, that we will provide more information for the stimulation of hormones using quantum dots.
And just to add on to that, another contribution is use it, using quantum dots to stimulate the brain. You could stimulate all parts of the brain, causing all other reactions. You can release all different types of hormones. This could be you, this could be widely used if we could only find out how to not cut a hole in someone's brain. And this brings us back to the original question we asked at the beginning: Can nanotechnology and nanoscale microscopy be used to artificially stimulate brain neurons? And through the methods that we have stated here, we think this is possible in a rat model. And uh, these are the resources we used. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Oh, dang. <laughs> we get, we're going to get a lot of questions. Okay. You. Okay. Or we'll hand you. Hi. I have a question about uh, the human growth hormone. And yeah. I, <laughs> and I was wondering, like, you said that you could use this to, like, increase people's heights. Yeah. Are there other things other than just human growth hormone that contribute to this? Well, okay, but human growth hormone is the one that increases the main height, so it can increase, like, basically, it mainly increases, like, muscle growth and, like, long bone growth, so they actually do use human growth hormone that's lab-produced in normal people, but this is just a way for you to use your own human growth hormone that your lab, pro that your brain produces that would be much more natural. Okay, I have a follow-up also. Okay. For the different, like ways for the different like causes of the disease you talk about like i think damage to the that part of the brain how would this be used if like that part is damaged one sec that one feels like or not developed properly um i'm not sure about this part because we are not mainly focused on the ghd we are just uh like um, proposing like a future experiment that we can be done by scientists through our experiment on rat model. Okay. Well, also one thing I'm going to add is if your pituitary gland is like missing or like not there, then I don't think this is the right treatment for you. I think you could, <laughs> there's going to be other ways for you to solve this and this this can only help you if you have at least a semi-functioning pituitary gland um, and hypothalamus that can actually create human growth hormone. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> we got we got a lot of questions. I don't know if that's good or bad. That is good. Have people detention? Yes, we if do. If you were to put a ballpark estimate on the probability of screwing this up irreparably, like <laughs> permanently screwing up somebody's brain, what would that be? Well, I mean, first of all, we're not going to jump first to the human model because yeah. no one wants to have a hole in their brain just so they can grow three inches taller. So I think first we're going to do a rat model, but if we could figure out a way, I was thinking maybe like nanobots, if a nanobot could like crawl through your nose or something, deposit like your quantum dots and then leave, that wouldn't cause that much damage because these quantum dots are tiny. Basically, they're one one, they're okay, one one hundred trillionth of the size of a single brain cell. So, as, if you could find a non-invasive way to get into the brain, having these quantum dots in there would not be a problem, at least that I know. Oh, we got more questions. So, you guys talked about like artificially changing, like the possibility of art artificially changing the height of a person. Yes. Do you think ethical questions will be raised uh, like against this? Okay, well, people uh, are already sort of doing this. This is already a technique, not this. The quantum dot thing is completely new, but like the idea of changing someone's height, adding more human growth hormone to make them grow taller, this is already being used. And uh, one thing that I just want to add is a lot of the times they use human growth hormone, like it's technically not the approved use of human growth hormone. The only approved use of human growth hormone is if you have a growth hormone deficiency, but people often use growth hormone to just grow taller just for like purely aesthetic reasons. And that's, and that could be damaging too because growth, like artificially lab created growth hormone does have some bad side effects that this might not. Oh, we got. Uh, hi, um, I thought it was a great presentation. It was really <laughs> oh, interesting to learn about. Um, okay, so I, I'm just a little confused on, I, I understand that the quantum dots can like target the pituitary, or you can put them in the pituitary yeah. gland. How does, because they're, they're phosphorescent, right? Mm -hmm. But how do they like lead to the um, pituitary gland actually secreting the hormones? 
Okay, so first you'd have to put them on the pituitary, the section of the, tooth of the pituitary gland that secretes and creates growth hormone. From there, you just stimulate the brain into think and kind of trick it into thinking there's a lack of that, which has been done in before uh, studies. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, and um, adding to that, I believe uh, when you shine the light on the quantum dots, um, they like emit energy. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, Dr. Bentioli, I think you had a question. Okay, I don't know. Ah. Um, I just wanted to say that's exactly why I love this class every year because I get to learn something new. And I say that as a compliment because until three days ago, I even didn't know we could make quantum dots out of orange juice. Yeah, so you can. And just by you bringing up that subject, I mean, it, that led to a discussion, and I did learn something. So, yes. Really yeah, cool. this is a side note, but for like the last two days, we've been spending like an hour in our oh, dorm, yeah. like uh, like our dorm microwave, spin. trying to make quantum dots in the microwave, and it might have worked, it might have not, but we've been trying. Yeah, yeah. it's being imaged right now. Yeah, it's being oh, imaged nice. right now. Nice. So we're using $5 quantum tots in a multi-million dollar machine. <laughs> so, just... We can wrap it up because this is running, but just yeah. for your question, um, if you're interested, there's a lot of interest groups, obviously, is one, they mentioned a word, optogenetics, okay, it's a very hot area, which is using light to basically modulate the activity of your genetic system, right, to target proteins that can become light sensitive, or genes to become light sensitive to produce proteins. So that is most likely the mechanism by which this approach would take, so if you're interested in our ability to control cells in your body using light. It's a new field called optogenetics. If you want to keep thinking about this, to get rid of your sunroof in the brain, there's another type of nanoparticle that's quite new called an upconversion nanoparticle. And what that does is it takes near-infrared light and converts it up into blue light, right? And infrared light can actually penetrate through tissue, yeah. right? So then you don't have to necessarily, there's a very recent work trying to do that so that they don't have to have the window in the brain. Infrared light has far deeper penetration, and if it's incident then on what's called an upconversion nanoparticle, it can produce the blue light, blue light required to genetically stimulate Kay. through optogenetics. So there are, there's a lot of work in this area that's quite new, um, but you may see it, you may not. We certainly don't want <laughs> sunroofs in our brain. Yeah. I can see that could be problematic. Thank you. Thank you.